My name is not Dr. Edwin Melendez. Uh, he is the director of Centro and he's not here today. My name is Luis Reyes. I'm the director of education uh, for the Center for Puerto Rican Studies. We welcome you uh, this evening to the library. We want you to be here in the actual Central Library. We who work at Central aren't necessarily all in the library and archives. We work at 68 and Lexington at the main Hunter uh, campus. And I wanted my colleagues to introduce themselves. Dr. Marisa Jimenez Garcia, and I'm a research associate at Centro in uh, American Literature, and Children's Literature, and Children's Studies. Marisa. Marisa. And I'm Dr. Consuela Martinez Reyes, and I'm also a research associate at Centro, uh, and I deal with uh, literature, representation, media, LGBT stuff. Consuela. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Carissa Gonzalez, and I work um, at Central as a, as a staff writer. Carissa uh, works on uh, articles that are published electronically in our on our webpage, uh, but also get sent out to our e-list, which is thousands of people uh, in New York and beyond. Correct. Mm -hmm. Uh, behind the, uh, our other team members, there's nobody's anonymous here. <laughs> oh, my name, I'm so sorry, Siri Miranda. Um, I work here with the database and some research topics. Like? Like, um, I have been working with immigration, matriculas consulares, um, and that's the research I'm interested in. We have one of our cameramen. I'm on. I'm part of the I do this stuff. All the time. Uh, and then our other camera person. Um, I'm Melissa, and I'm also with the media team. Melissa. And the director. Victor Martinez. I work with a social media platform such as Centro, and also with research about how Puricas use social media in the United States. So are you in charge of our Twitter account? Yeah, the Twitter and Facebook accounts. And I post all the stuff in those accounts. <laughs> and somewhere here is uh, Richard Unapanta. He's the director of Central TV, uh, who are uh, working with us today. Oh. Hi. Um, yes, I'm um, Omar Dawahere. Uh, I work for the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, uh, communications manager, and I deal with uh, everything that come out, comes out of Centro as far as uh, website, uh, media, uh, press releases, uh, you write a newsletter, an electronic magazine, also social media, um, just to project Centro and Centro's resources to the entire world. You're going to hear about our Puerto Rican history poster series, and there was just a front page article a week or ten days ago in uh, Primera Hora, which is a newspaper in Puerto Rico, uh, about uh, this whole series with actual pictures from the posters and a very complete uh, explanation in Spanish. So we're hoping that we'll see more of that because. We Omar's work. Oh. Hi everybody, my name is Yosunik Sorengo. I'm one of the librarians here and you're in my space right now. This is the library and archives. I you know I work with um with people every day. I help people out find their resources and um, I also work with the archives. I know a lot about all the little items you'll see here and we'll go over all of that in detail later on. So welcome, welcome to the library. Su casa es nuestra casa. <laughs> right? That's right. Uh, este libro es Su libro. ¿Quién es usted, señor? Oh, my goodness. <coughs> I'm Humberto Cintrón. I, I write stuff. <laughs> <laughs> He's written a book called El Barrio, which is in our collection, among other books. So you're uh, one 
degree of distance from our actual authors. Uh, briefly want to talk about the mission of Centro, a little bit of its history, uh, and this presentation was made two years ago. It tells you something about uh, the challenges and opportunities Puerto Ricans in the United States, uh, which is related to the Centro's uh, mission, and then the programs, research and publications, library and archives, uh, education, outreach, and where do we go from here? Where we go is to the next slide. Uh, what is the mission? To produce, facilitate, and disseminate interdisciplinary research, economics, politics, literature, literature <laughs> women's studies, history, uh, sociology, all of those fields of study uh, to disseminate research about the experiences of Puerto Ricans in the United States. The Center for Puerto Rican Studies is not focused primarily on Puerto Rico, uh, but on the experience of Puerto Ricans in the United States, which includes uh, migrating from Puerto Rico and migrating from places before that to Puerto Rico. Uh, and a second mission is to collect, preserve, and provide access to archival and library resources. And Yosinex will tell us about library and uh, archival resources telling our story. You came here today because of your interest as students in doing research on Latinos and hopefully including Puerto, uh, Puerto Ricanos. So our research program is to have an agenda that relates to community priorities. Education, employment, uh, housing, migration and integration into the into the workforce, but also into the surrounding community. Uh, we want our library, which is here in El Barrio, East Harlem, and was on 68th Street up until two years ago, uh, for many, many years. We want all those resources to get to Boston, to Buffalo, to Baja California, to Del Mar, uh, San Diego, where there are Puerto Ricans, to Hawaii, where there are Puerto Ricans, as well as to St. Croix and New Orleans. And how do we do that? We do it we, by digitizing uh, and getting our resources available electronically. Centro was founded uh, as one of the, the first institutes before the Mexican Studies Institute, which was founded now two years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, the Dominican Studies Institute at City College, which has been around for many years. But Centro is 40 years old. And it was at a period where Puerto Rican Studies and Black Studies were coming into the university a veces a la buena y a veces a la mala. Meaning the community teachers, community leaders, students uh, demanded, educators demanded that the colleges and universities including, included our story in the books, in the curriculum. Uh, and so the founding director, uh, if you look behind you, there's a wall of pioneros, leaders, and on the left bottom, uh, there's the second to the left is Frank Bonilla. He is the founding director. He was actually a full professor at Stanford University who came back from Stanford in California to New York to help write the proposal to the Ford Foundation to fund the Center for Puerto Rican Studies with the help of other community leaders and researchers. The, it's, we were a small part geograph, uh, de demographically, numbers wise, of the Latinos in the United States uh, over the years. The, our presence in New York 
in about the year 1900, after the Spanish-American War, was in the thousands. Today, our presence in New York is more than a million in the state of New York. Uh, people have moved, and so you'll, we hopefully will get a chance to show you uh, through our poster uh, how we've moved and migrated uh, from Puerto Rico to New York, to Boston, Chicago, uh, Philadelphia, Boston, Newark, Miami, Hawaii. Uh, there were Puerto Rican workers who were contracted in Puerto Rico and brought by boat to Florida and on trains went across the southern part of the United States through the south, Yuma, Texas, into California, San Francisco, and there to take boats to go to Hawaii to work on plantations in Hawaii because the native Hawaiians uh, were uh, not working uh, in those plantations and they, they needed more workers. And so uh, when I went to, uh, to Hawaii in 1976 as a graduate student, I saw a woman cleaning uh, my hotel room who looked like my aunt. I asked her her name, it wasn't the same family. In fact, she is or was Puerto Rican. And her family had come here uh, 50, 60 years prior to when I met her. Uh, so, estamos por todas partes y en todos los estados de Estados Unidos hoy en día. There are more Puerto Ricans in the 50 states than there are in the island of Puerto Rico. So, do you know, anybody know of any other country where there are more people from that country outside of the country than inside the country? Ireland. Ireland. There are more Irish people of Irish descent, children of Irish. In the, in the entire United States than in Ireland. In, then in Ireland. So there's been an immigration in the 19th century of the Irish uh, uh, after the famine and through the 19th and 20th century and in the late 20th and early 21st century there's, there have been a lo lots of migration of emigration of Irish to the United States and today that continues with Puerto Ricans as well. Uh, I'm Loya Dejan and I'm going to ask my colleague Yosinex to tell us about the library at Harvard. All right, well first give me like a few minutes to um, set up real quick. I need to just access it. Gabriel, did you want to say anything before? Um, sure. Uh, let me, while I set up, go ahead. Um, well, go ahead and go through. So it's great to see you all here. I'm really excited that you made it and that we were able to have uh, the Academy of Urban Planning present. And thanks to you and to Mr. Sandoval for, for making this happen with your students. This is all about you. This is all about you understanding uh, not only your history and culture, but that of your neighbors, of your friends, um, the stories of your abuelas, of your abuelos, your tios. That is valid, that is important, and that is what we research and what we study here. And all these people are dedicated to making these histories come to light. Um, Mr. Mr. Reyes was talking about the stories that are in the textbooks. Those are in there because people fight to have those stories in the textbooks. Still to this day, the stories are not being told the way that we want them to be told. We need to tell our own stories. That's why it's important that you become writers, you become academics, you are intellectuals, and to develop that, and this is a resource for you to come, to learn, to enjoy, to platicar con all these people here. Um, they're the, the researchers, the scholars, the writers here, the activists, that these people are preserving our, our histories and our cultures, and we need to make, uh, make sure that it continues. So you are the next generation. You are the next uh, professors, the next authors, the next um, book publishers. 
So you need to take, um, you are obviously taking this seriously, so I, I really appreciate that. I'm glad that, that you're all here. My name is Gabriel Higuera. Uh, I work with CUNY. Uh, I teach uh, in the College Now program, where high school students come to the co college campus uh, and they take college level, college style courses. Uh, I teach uh, culturally relevant writing, so I help young people develop their, their voice and their voice that is influenced by their, their families, by their traditions, by their, their cultures. Uh, I'm also the organizer of the annual CUNY High School Student Symposium on Latino, Latina, and Latin American Studies. So that's where, where what we're kind of prepping for is this symposium that's going to happen May 2nd at Queens College. This is the second annual. We're working hard to make this be an annual thing because CUNY has all of these great resources and where we really want to highlight that. It's one of the most unique uh, centers of learning in the whole country. Uh, we were talking earlier that no university has a center for Puerto Rican studies, an institute for Dominican studies, an institute of Mexican studies. So with all those and, and more things that CUNY offers, it's, it's pretty unbelievable. And we're trying to harness all of that power and really make sure that New York City continues to teach uh, ethnic studies, Latina, Latino studies, estudios puertorriqueños in the high schools. Unfortunately, it's not being done in the high schools. And still, the curriculum, the, lots, of these, lots of these classes are being taught from a Eurocentric point of view, a Euro-American point of view. Even though the classes are maybe 80% Latino, uh, that's, not being, that's not being done. So we need to keep on fighting. La, la lucha sigue. This place was established because people fought, community members, family members, professors, neighbors, all fought to make uh, Puerto Rican studies happen, fought to make uh, black studies, African American studies happen. And it's, it's something that we can't sleep on. We have to continue struggling and fighting and making our voices heard. Um, that's why it's just really great to, to hang out with these people because we share the same passion, the same ideas. Um, schooling was difficult for me because I wasn't being reflected in the textbooks. I, my, my stories, my cultures weren't being reflected in, in the faces of the teachers. Um, so it's important that, that we continue these conversations um, in a respectful but yet, um, you know, impassioned way because, because it, is, it is that important. It is a matter of being, being respected, of being accepted into the fabric of our country because it is a country of immigrants and it's important that we tell our stories and be the ones writing our stories. Again, my name is Yosinek Sorengo. It's kind of a weird name. My, my father made it up. Um, and I've been with Centro, I've been part of the Central Library and Archives now for seven years, but my history with Centro actually goes much, much further back than that. I used to be a college assistant um, and a work study for Centro back in the year 2000 when I was doing my undergrad at Hunter. And then after I finished graduating from Hunter, I actually got a job in Japan, taught English in Japan for a few years. And I came back to Centro one day just to say hi, just to see how things were going, and I was offered a job to work at the library. I had no idea that I'd, you know, become a librarian one day. You know, and you know, it's like who studies that? But I did. You know, so it's it's one of my passions right now. And um, I actually I'm actually a Queens College alum myself, so like, you know, I'm I'm very aware of like the institution there, and all that. And so that you know that's a little thing. So if you want to ask me about Japan and stuff like that later, you can. Yeah. But um, anyway, so I have two little presentations for you. Um, one is on the archives. I'm not one of the archivists. The senior archivist is actually a away right now. So um, I'm going to present his presentation on his behalf. And after that, I'll be doing my own presentation on the library. So the library presentation will be better. I know that one a little more. But anyway, so um, let's start. So um, um, the archives has been a part of us now for not as long as um, Central has been around, maybe now about 30 years. And um, well, first things first, does anybody know the difference between a library and an archives? Anybody? Anybody in our group? Anybody want to take a guess? What sort of things do you find in, in an archive? Yes? Background, like history? History, yeah. You do find history. Pictures. Pictures, yes. That's the main thing you find in archives. What else? Anyone else? So what, what would be the difference between a library and an archives then? Like what, is, what are some things you would find in a library? There's books about anything. Yeah, books. Books are like the main thing. So in, in the, the best way to put it is that um, the archives you'll find what we call primary sources. So you'll find you know, documents, you'll find 
photographs, handwritten letters, you know, memorandum from, from different institutions, those kind of things that are like, you know, the pure, the pure, like, unprocessed information, you know, and, and Consuelo will talk a little bit more about that later on in her presentation. Whereas in the library, you find things that are the product of the archives. So, like, you know, books are usually made as a product of the tools that you find in the archives, and I'll show you some samples of, the, of that throughout the presentation. One sample of one things that we have in our, in our archival collection are the oral history projects. Those are audio recordings of various prominent Puerto Ricans, like, um, like we have the Jesus Colon oral history records, we have the garment industry records. We're also doing an initiative right now called the 100 Puerto Ricans, where we're going around and, and gathering the papers, the photographs, and the stories of notable Puerto Ricans throughout the country. So, you know, you don't have to be a famous superstar. You could be just a local politician, a teacher, educator, a religious individual, anything like that. As long as you have some sort of contribution to um, the Puerto Rican diaspora, you know, then we will accept your papers. And that's my next question. Does anybody know what a diaspora is? Anybody? Luis kind of touched on it a little bit. Um, Hmm? No, I was just saying. Oh, okay. The silence. So, um, diaspora refers to like the people that live like outside of the mainland. So, for example, like um, you know, you know, you have Chinatown here, right? That would be considered part of the Chinese diaspora because they're not in China right now. Or like slavery created much of the African diaspora. So, Puerto Ricans here in Harlem, for example, represent a portion of the Puerto Rican diaspora. So they're not in Puerto Rico, but they are still Puerto Rican. So that's what we we refer to as a diaspora. Okay. Forward. Sorry about this, it's a little slow. I'll see if you go to ask for um, So yeah, these are some samples of items you'll find in the ar archival collections. For example, you'll see photographs, you'll see baggage claims, you'll see tickets. Sometimes you'll see tickets for like theaters and events. And those those items, those tickets, those those um, movie stubs, the uh, photographs, they all tell a story of that particular era. You know, you get to see what people wore, what people thought, you know, what was acceptable in those eras. So, you know, it's a they, they're an important aspect of maintaining our history and our, of telling our story to future generations to come. Here's some more examples of the documents that we have here. In the, in the archives, which is um, down, housed downstairs, we have thousands of boxes of different individuals. And these individuals on the wall here um, represent like the various archival collections that we have. For example, um, the lady on the upper left, right, De Pura Belpre, she's the first Puerto Rican and Latina librarian, and she's also a known like um, storyteller. She used puppets to tell various stories. You have Joseph Manserrat, who was um, the, the director of the um, Migration Division. You have Pedro Pietri, who he's blocking right now, but he's a very controversial poet, and various other individuals. You know, we can go on and on about each person. Each one could take a whole class if you wanted to. So our photograph collection is one of the, the most important things that we have. We have over 100,000 photographs. Um, some of them are prints, as you can see represented on these walls here. Some of them are, are like the negatives, so you know, they're unprocessed film. Um, the interesting thing about these photographs is that they actually tell a story of like the Puerto Rican migration, um, actually leaving Puerto Rico, getting on the boats and everything, settling in communities, finding employment, demonstrations and festivals, and Puerto Ricans today. So you know, have a tour of that later on you. When you have a chance, I have a question. Now. Yes. Uh, where do we do, where do you uh, get all these stuff? Um, for the most part, archival collections are donated to us by either the individual who who collected the um, documents or by their families when they pass away. It, it depends. Every every archival collection has a different story, so that's how we get it. Sometimes we get the original, sometimes we get duplicates. You know, but we try our best to get the the original original documents. Any other questions? All right. So here's another example, you know, of like um, one of the first archival collection that we had from the Jesus Colon papers. That's that one is a very significant collection. A lot of people use it to um, to conduct research, and um, we have a few of his books in our collection as well. Um, one of my favorite collections is the Justo Mati photograph. That one alone is over 10,000 photographs, and he chronicles like. Like, like um, he's Cuban himself, but he chronicled a lot of the Puerto Rican communities in the 1950s and 60s. You'll see like samples of places in Brooklyn, you know, here in Harlem, and various others. A lot of people like to go through his collection, but it's a really dense and heavy collection. You know, so you'll have to use our our guides. We have certain guidebooks here called the Finding Aids, which allow you to kind of have an idea of what you'll find in these boxes. And here's some other faces of the archival collections that we have. Some of them are the same faces you see here. Um, you know, more stuff on the diaspora. 
And we're also, we also collaborate with like um, other archival institutions like the um, National Archives. We've done projects like at um, Ventana del Pasado. We've, we've done also projects known as um, the Electronic Schoolhouse where we were trying to provide like an educational program for people to learn on Latin, like Puerto Ricans and other Latino groups. Um, and that's, this is the archival space. Um, about 60% of our archival collections are housed here downstairs. The other 40% are housed upstate in a storage facility called Iron Mountain. It's like a, some secret caves or something, you know, so, you know. Whenever, whenever we have people requesting those, we, have, we, we ask that people come and make an appointment because we have to order them and get them here. So, you know, that's, that's something to keep in mind. And um, yeah, welcome, welcome to the building. This is uh, where we are right now. So now I'm going to do my second presentation on, on the library. But before I do that, does anybody have any questions on the archives? None? Okay. Are the archives available to the public or just CUNY students? It's available to the public. You just have to make an appointment for the archives. And um, for the library, you could just walk in. What, what's, uh, what's the significance of Jesus Colón? As it was, it was the first, the first uh, archival material that you got. And, I, and, I, and I'm a huge Jesus Colón fan. I actually have an, an autographed copy of a, a Puerto Rican in New York. Right. But for, for the students that, that don't know, why could you explain why Jesus Colón is, is so important? Maybe that, that's not your specific field. But yeah, that's that's more Pedro's field of expertise, I think. But I mean, from what I know, I mean, he was, you know, we, we have a lot of his publications here, and it's a large collection that's heavily consulted here. We, it's full of photographs. He was one of the earlier people to, to migrate over here and actually, like, start fighting for the rights of, of Puerto Ricans here. So that was, that's his significance here. I don't know every little detail, but the picture you have that you saw on his identity card, I think it says war zone. Because yeah. he, he arrived uh, uh, during World War One, I, I believe. Right. Right, right, and and that picture right there is actually reproduced from his ID, like mm -hmm. from his little, mm -hmm. from his ID from that era. And these signatures are their signatures. You know, we we found them somehow. You know, these are like that that signature there for under Jesus Colon was in his ID card. So, it's pretty. Over in the uh, the window, the uh, escaparate, the the display case there, is uh, the founder of Aspida. Puerto Rican youth organization. Anybody heard of Aspida? It's a high school, worked with high school students, and they have clubs. Uh, the founder, Antonia Pantoja, uh, was a social worker. She's actually a graduate, a, a master's degree from Hunter College School of Social Work, and she has a doctorate from a union Institute, I forget the exact name of it. But Dr. Pantoja founded a whole bunch of organizations, including ASPIDA, the Puerto Rican Forum, uh, what today is Boricua College. Anybody know where, heard of Boricua College? It was originally Universidad Boricua in Washington, D.C. And it didn't last there. And then it closed down. And the president of Boricua College many years ago took the idea and re revived it and into Boricua College. Uh, president Clinton, when he was president, gave the medal that you see in the display case, the Medal of Freedom to Dr. Pantoja. Uh, and that was a, that's a very rare accomplishment for anybody in the United States, but especially for uh, someone who's Puerto Rican. Uh, and uh, so we, we have a picture of her receiving the medal and the medal itself. Uh, and it's just an example. Pura Bel Pre, the, the pub, public librarian, who was a storyteller, she used puppets in telling stories in the libraries to children. She would tell them folk, Puerto Rican folk tales and she used puppets. And so we actually have puppets, I believe, but I'm gonna shut up. <laughs> yeah, we do, we do have the puppets in the archives. Those are the sort of things you'll find in the archives. It's not just photos or documents, you know, you'll have like physical items, like like the actual puppets that she used to tell um, the stories. But Marilisa will go into that later. I don't wanna take all her, all her thunder away from her. So yeah, here's my um, second presentation. It's on the, um, the library. 
Um, our collection is bilingual, so in some cases trilingual. You know, you'll see a few books. We have a few books on mo most of our books are in English or Spanish. There's some in Dutch. I've seen some in German, and I saw one that's trilingual itself. It's in English, Spanish, and Japanese within the same book. So, you know, there's all kinds of things. But our our collection is non-circulating. Do you know what that means? Do you know what I mean by that? Anyone? What I mean by non-circulating is that we don't lend out our materials. You'd have to come here and actually view the materials yourself, make photocopies or whatever. Okay. Um, for the most part, our collection is used by by students. You know, we get a lot of students from Hunter. We get um, a lot of people who are doing their PhDs, their dissertations, writing like papers, or even people who are trying to produce books and things like that. Um, people who are interested in looking at archival collections, but it's open to the public. Anybody can come. Anybody can come here and actually use our space. Um, we also get people that like to look up their family histories, and we do have some of that in the archives as well. So, you know, we get a wide range of researchers of all ages. You know, you're not too young or too old to come to the, to the library. And um, um, our, co our collection is actually viewable on the CUNY Plus catalog. The CUNY Plus catalog is um, a catalog that's shared with all the different CUNY schools. So Hunter, BMCC, Queens College, um, College of Staten Island, all those colleges all share the same catalog. So if you want to look up which books we have here, just use the CUNY Plus catalog. And um, you know, you can make copies of anything that, that, um, that you find here. And I just want to show you some samples of, of books that we have here. You know. Um, and some of the books you'll see right there in the tables with you. Um, this one right here is um, Pioneros. It's written by, by the archivist and one of the former directors um, of here, um, um, Felix Matos. And, it, and it's using materials from the archival collections. So it's right here. Um, this book uses like various images from our archival collections to tell various um, stories of Puerto Ricans from um, 1896 to 1948. And there's actually a second volume that, that continues on to, the, to Soto Mayor. So you know these are these are books worth checking out. So have a have a look at them when we're done with this presentation. Um, and as I mentioned before, we don't just have books on on Puerto Ricans. We have like stuff by Juno Diaz. We have also books on like the South Bronx. You know of um, the, the the deterioration that was going on down there, which is you know we could also have an entire lecture about what happened there. You know um, the Taínos, the original people that inhabited the island of Puerto Rico. Books on music, literature, religion. You know we have. Various, various topics. Yeah, and another major highlight of our collection are um, our, what we have on the, the dissertations. We have um, over 2,500 doctoral dissertations from from students from many universities. You know, these are people that have come and done their research, done a paper so that they can earn their PhD. And um, many people come here to actually look at those dissertations so they can see what sort of research has been done already. It's a good place to start if you're if you're trying to decide what. What sort of research has been conducted? What can you do differently, or what can you do? What can you repeat and find different results with? Um, and in addition to that, we have um, like your regular reference material. So we have encyclopedias, dictionaries, atlases, you know, who's who in, in in Puerto Rico, things like that. And one of the biggest and most important collections we have here are the microfilm holdings. The has anybody here ever used microfilm? I doubt it. Everybody here just uses Google and everything like that. But the microfilm collection is one of my favorite collections here because it, it holds a lot of our newspapers. So we have like, um, for example, you know, have you heard of El Diario La Prensa, right? The Spanish, one of the major Spanish-speaking newspapers here in, in New York City. Um, we have um, La Prensa going as far back as 1917 on microfilm and El Diario going as far back as 1948, before they became one paper. They merged together to form El Diario La Prensa in 1963. And um, what's important about having these things on microfilm is that it's, a, it's the best way to preserve it right now. It's, I mean, you could preserve them digitally, but with microfilm, they last a long time. They, it's better than actually holding the papers. Those newspapers, if we had a 1917 paper today, as soon as I took it out, it would just crumble. So you know, it's important to like preserve these sort of documents. Um, another highlight of the collection is our children's books, which we'll be drilling in your heads over and over today. Um, but I'll just highlight one of them. Um, one of my favorite children's books that we have here is called um, Con La Otra Mano, With the Other Hand. And it's about being left-handed. And as someone who's left-handed, you know, I like these kind of stories that show, you know, there are different kids out there. We have other, other um, stories like, you know, um, Comisia de, red, de Ruedas, you know, someone on a wheelchair. Soy gordito, but it's okay, I'm fat, it's okay. You know, all kinds of like little fun, cute stories. And we have various other um, children's literature, but I, I won't spoil another presentation right now. Um, 
in addition to you know, like regular books that you'll find here. We also have a, a heavy collection of magazines. We have over 500 different journals and magazines. Some of these are scholarly journals and some of these are just regular magazines. Magazines on hip hop, magazines on Latina style, on politics, um, journals of social sciences and things like that. Um, and we have an extensive film collection as well, mostly consisting of documentaries, things on like the Young Lords Party, on on various things like the Ponce massacre that occurred, um, sterilization, which is another heavy topic, um, and we also have a few feature films. We have West Side Story in our collection. You know, you have to have things like that. We have the Warriors for some reason. You gotta have that, I guess. You know, so that's that's part of our collection. And um, we also have many um, electronic databases that you can access here when you visit our location, and a lot of these are shared with Hunter, so you could view like different newspapers online, even things like the New York Times, so you can go back to the earliest New York Times articles that we have. Um, and we have a few links here, but many of those links are, are reproduced on the handouts that we have. So, I think, I'm, oh, yeah, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, like us, follow us, you know, write to us. Um, if, you, if you follow us on Facebook, you'll be able to keep track of different events that Central has, um, so, you know, it's worth, worth finding out. You know? Any questions on the library? If they were to follow you on Facebook and they had a question, would they be able to post it or message you guys and would you respond? Um, yeah. We have, yeah? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> all right. How, that, how does that happen? Well, you send us a message and uh, um, Victor, we met, uh, manages the, the pages. Um, he'll bring it to the uh, according the person who might be best for that. Yeah, and also for the library um, on our website, you have access to um, the, the like ask a librarian question, where you know they'll send it to our email and we can answer. We try to answer within a few days. So that's another way. Any other questions about the library? Okay, I hope you now know the difference between a library and an archive. We'll quiz you later. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I guess now I'll pass the floor to Marilisa to give a little presentation on. Okay. Well, my name is Dr. Jimenez Marilisa. I always call me Marilisa um, so, because that's my name, right? So they should call me that. Um, but I wanted to talk to you about how I use the library. So I'm not going to be talking about the archive. I'm going to be talking about the library. And like Yosinek said, it's non-circulating, which means you can't take the books with you, which means that while I'm here, I really have to make sure that I concentrate on the books that I take out, right, and observe them because I know I can't run off with them for five months or something like that, even though sometimes he has to stop me because sometimes I do want to take books home. Um, and that's because I, I love children's books and they have a lot of uh, great collections um, of that. And some of these books I've never been able to find for myself. So I'm like, oh, I'm sure they would miss it if I took it, but that I never do. I, I don't take them. That's why we have cameras. That's why they have the cameras <laughs> to stop me. Um, but anyway, I wanted to show you some of the books that I've been looking at recently um, and then I'm going to talk to you about how I look at the books while I'm here so that I make sure I, I use my time efficiently. Um, this is a book, it's a recent book um, by Eric Velasquez and it's called Grandma's Records. It's a picture book. This is what's called a picture book in children's literature which means that there's pictures and it's a book, right? Um, but there's different books, right? Like there's the picture book, there's the novel, there's the chapter book. This is a picture book um, and this is a really interesting book because it shows afro boricua uh, heritage, right? And it's also about a story um, about a little boy and his grandmother and how his grandmother um, influenced his life. I'm going to pass that around a little bit. Um, and then this is one of the probably more famous books in the collection. It's Perez and Martina by Pura Belpre, who Yosanas was talking about. And she's the second person up here um, on the first row. Um, and she was the first Latina librarian, Puerto Rican librarian. She was an author, storyteller, de todo, and you can imagine she did. Um, and this was actually her first publication, 1931. Um, and it's also a picture book. And I don't know how many of you have seen this book before or heard this story. No? Okay. One thing that I think is interesting for me as a researcher, okay, is that I get to be in a library where they have books about my history, okay, that I, I'm from Puerto Rico, I was born in Puerto Rico, and for me growing up, I never had this. I never had the ability to go to a library and say, oh wow, these are the books by Puerto Ricans. I didn't even know that Puerto Ricans had written books until like a couple years ago, okay, because we didn't have classes on Puerto Rican studies or Latino studies or anything. So I think it's awesome that you guys today 
have that opportunity. And I think that if you have the ability to, to look at these things, you should definitely embrace it. Because I can tell you, for me, this is my, the first time me being around it, and I, I just get so excited by that. Um, it's a great thing to be able to know your history, right? To be able to know um, the kind of people that, that went before you. Um, this is another book that I've been looking at. And um, what's interesting about this book is that it's not written by a Puerto Rican. Okay? It's in our collection, but it's not necessarily written, written by a Puerto Rican, but it's about Puerto Ricans. Okay? So I'm always kind of looking at books like this because I want to know what people who may not be from a culture are saying about a culture. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so in children's literature we call that insider or outsider. So in this case this would be an outsider writing about a particular culture. So I'm going to be thinking, okay, how are they representing Puerto Ricans at the time? So the first thing I do actually when I look at a book like this is I go to the copyright and I look at what year, okay? So here it's 1964. So if I'm, looking, if I'm thinking 1964, I'm going to be thinking what was going on at the time in terms of history. If it's 1964, what was going on at the time? What do you think? Where would that put us? 1964. U.S. history. <laughs> They're so far removed from that right now. They yeah. took that last year. So. Last year. Da -da, da -da. Civil rights movement. Da -da -da -da. Civil rights da -da, da -da. movement. I don't know. Something like the civil rights movement around this time. Okay. So that's interesting to me that this is probably being written at that time. I'm also going to look at the author. Okay. I'm going to look What's at who published it. Where was it published? That sort of thing. And then I'm going to look at the story. Okay, and this one happens to be uh, actually what I would consider not the best book in terms of how it represents Puerto Ricans because it's actually very stereotypical um, in terms of how it's like, you know, this little boy has a lot of problems. He's not exactly the smartest little boy in the world. You know, the way that they're representing um, the, the Puerto Rican culture, okay? Um, so, I look at the year, I look at the story, I think about who's representing and how the representing of, of the culture is happening. Another thing that's interesting about Centro is that it has books by Puerto Ricans from here, from the United States, but also has books from the island. Okay, so the island of Puerto Rico and some of the books that were being used by children on the island to go to school, like a textbook, right? Like the textbooks that we have in school. This is a textbook, of, a math textbook. Um, from published on the island. This is something that is really interesting because on the island there are these little characters that are usually in um, in Puerto Rican uh, textbooks and they're called Pepe y Lola. Pepe y Lola. And Pepe y Lola are like these almost like a Let's see, Dick and Jane, or like the typical two kids that you always have in these stories, and either they get in trouble or something bad happens to them and they learn from their mistakes. Okay, so that's Pepe and Lola in Puerto Rico. And this is Pepe and Lola. Okay. This is a math book. Wouldn't you have wanted to have a math book like this with all these nice pictures? I know I didn't have any math books like this. If I would have had a math book like this, I might have done better. Um, but what's interesting about this math book is that I'm going to be looking at it for how it shows culture. Okay, so yeah, it's showing you how to add, it's how to subtract, but it's doing it in a way that you understand um, some of the sociological, cultural things that are happening in terms of the island. So, um, for example, you know, it's going to talk about Pepe y Lola en la finca. You know, con el, con el cochinito y de abuelo and all this other stuff. So I'm learning my word problems, but I'm learning it in a way that um, I guess what we would call today would be culturally relevant, right? So this is an interesting book for me um, to look at, okay? Um, in terms of, yeah, it's a math book, but it's also showing me some things about culture. I'm going to pass that around. Um, we also have um, some folk tales, okay, which is similar to this one. Um, this is the tiger and the rabbit. I talked about this a little while ago, and this is a folk tale about um, a tiger and a rabbit and how they have a lot of friction between the two of them. Um, and there's also a lot of other stories here about animals. But what's interesting about these folk tales is that they're going to give you a sense of what um, is going on in island culture. Okay, and then. These are in English, so they're not in Spanish, so that you can use them in terms of English classes here and that sort of thing. So those are some of the things that I uh, particularly look for in terms of the, the books that I'm looking at. So looking at the history, looking at um, what's going on at the time, thinking about the author. Who is this author? Is it an insider? Is it an outsider? Where was it published? And what can I learn in terms of the culture and the history of, of what's being represented? Okay. Any questions about that? No? No? 
Pepe and Lola? You won't forget Pepe and Lola, right? Okay, um, I'm going to be around afterwards to uh, take more questions or anything like that, but it's great to meet, meet you, and like I said, this is a great opportunity for you to learn more about your history, and I hope you will take advantage of any kind of research that you can do here at the library and in other institutes around CUNY, okay? Thank you. I'm Consuelo, Dr. Martinez, but Consuelo's my name. It's a set, now it should be used. Uh, and in case the PowerPoint never shows up, um, I brought uh, the copies so that you look at the material. This could be for these papers, but they're the same. Uh, I wanted to talk about what we do when we look at these boxes. Say you have to write a paper and you want to write about uh, something for the weekend, and you each have your interests. Uh, my interests always revolve around representation. So I look at media or theater, um, things like that. And so I look at a lot at the boxes. And these boxes, you never know what you're going to find. <laughs> it's, uh, as Justin X was explaining, it can, uh, it can contain all sorts of things from, yeah, this is a, from flyers to photos to letters. Thank you. So so these also just when like I said these boxes contain the unprocessed information too. It's very easy to just grab a book and read and have somebody tell us what happened and what this is all about. But when you have to come up with what happened, it's kind of like putting together a puzzle. And you do get a box with a lot of pieces, and you don't know what it means or what the big picture is. And it's a lot of fun, because you get to tell people what what's in there. But it can be challenging. I will never forget the first time I opened a box, and I went like, you know, I have no idea where, how I'm going to use that, and what am I supposed to say? How am I going to write a paper about this? This is useless. It can be very frustrating. But it is not. And I brought you uh, samples of what I found when I was um, in my most recent project, when I was trying to put together the story of Victor Fragoso. And Victor Fragoso is someone who um, was born and raised in Puerto Rico. In his 20s, came to, the, uh, to New York, to the US, and did a lot of theater here. But we usually hear about his poetry. And I knew he did theater, but we know nothing about him. We don't have a book like this that explains to us who was Victor Fragoso what kind of theater he did, what was he trying to do. And so I want to build that story. I want to be able to tell people, well, he was here in New York in the 70s, and as part of the social movement, this is what he was trying to do. So I have a box with a lot of different things, and I'm freaking out, and I don't know what I'm going to do about it. I can either read the plays and talk about what the plays are trying to represent, and how did he want to represent Latinos? Or for example, this play is about Julia de Burgos, uh, which is very important in Puerto Rico. Well, I'm here, a very important poet. So we can talk about that, but we can also talk about the actual materials that we find in the boxes. So for example, I see this, and you can think, it's just a play. But you can also talk about, well, I can talk about uh, who were the actors, who funded the play. This is all information that you actually find in this. Um, let me show you another one. If this moves. <laughs> you can uh, find out about uh, who funded these. Uh, there are some funny ones that they, they write, well, this was um, uh, brought to you by ourselves. And so that means that the actors were doing this for free and that they actually requested maybe a church space to be available for them to practice for free. But then you have a song where uh, they write, you know, this was brought to you by the, the National Council of, for the Arts or for the Humanities. Or, so you know that the government was backing them up. And that's some kind of information that you can get uh, from this. Um, you can also, it's not moving, so it's good that you have that. You can also find, um, let me see. There you go. Oh, yeah, there. 
You can also find out uh, how much it costs to go to the theater. For example, it was important for Fragoso that everybody could go to the theater and that everybody could understand it because at the time people thought that theater is something that rich people do. They have the money to go to theater and they see Shakespeare. Well, he wanted to do something that everybody, you know, they were paying $2, which, okay, now it's ridiculously cheap, but even then it was very accessible. So he would make sure that it was accessible. Uh, uh, he would make sure that if it was necessary, a play would be in Spanish or in English or in Spanglish. And this is something that we can find in the boxes. I go through the box and I see three different versions of the same play and I go, why? And then you flip and you see he's trying to translate some phrases because he understood that maybe Puerto Ricans in Loisaida uh, spoke Spanish every day, but Puerto Ricans in Bushwick spoke more English. Mm -hmm. So if he was presenting in Bushwick, then he wanted it in English. Uh, where he got his inspiration from? Oh, yes. You're, no, I'm sorry. I thought you had a question. Where he got his inspiration from was another uh, piece of information we can find. And you have there, uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's one in English, but the next one there. You find a lot of paper clippings. He wrote a play about uh, street dwellers, uh, uh, which was called the first, first Night Out Bad Ladies Story. And he wrote about these ladies because at the time there were a lot of stories about people living on the streets and how come they ended up in the street and the dangers they found in the street. So now we know that he actually was writing about that because it was on the newspapers. Um, I also wondered which language did he prefer? Did he prefer Spanish or English? Uh, and that's something you can write a paper on. You know, you research these box boxes and you find that, um, and you, you have samples around. You find that he wrote the synopsis of the play in Spanish, and this is for himself. And so he had the idea in Spanish, but then if he developed uh, notes for the actors and actresses, uh, what what do you want to think about when you portray this character? He wrote the notes in English, and vice versa. Sometimes he would, he would write notes for himself in English. So this is something you can write about. Well, how did he leave the code switching, the language switching? And the last example I brought was the two flyers of La Era Latina, which was a very, which is a very uh, funny play uh, about what it means to be Latino. And so, depending on who was watching the play and who gave money for the play, the propaganda was different. And you can see that here. So you can say, oh, when it was targeting only Latinos or only Puerto Ricans, they had maybe something more, uh, you know, if there's the image of Puerto Rican people, or what to me looks like Puerto Rican people. But if you wanted a wider audience, then maybe it's something more artistic, uh, something more general. So there are topics that you can write about. There are many, many, many materials, and you never know what is going to come out of them. But the the important thing is that you come here with an idea of what you want to write about. I know I wanted to write about theater. And then you see the materials and there's a lot of surprises. And, and you think, well, I see Spanish and English. I, I see different propaganda. Uh, I see different places where this was presented. And so I can write about that. So you create the story and you tell people, well, this is what was happening with uh, Puerto Rican theater in the 70s in New York. That's, that's just an example. You can always come and ask just an ex. <laughs> what do you think is in the boxes? And that's going to be fun. Uh, but so that's why he's here. Thank you. But, uh, but let me just ask you, what might you be interested in doing research about? Forget uh, the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, but if you were doing a paper that had to do with Latino studies, what might you be interested in? They're all currently have papers, so they should be able to speak on them now. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
go one by one then. Um, when they travel to here. To Who's they? When immigrants travel to the United States. From a particular place? Um, well, who are you interviewing in yours? My mother. And you, so then your mother's from where? Dominican so you're going to be doing Dominican Republic. So you might, might, or oh, might not use the center, for, uh, the Dominican Studies Institute at City College as a resource? Yeah, I think. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. How about yourself? I was doing um, LGBTQ bullying, so I was going to focus on uh, Hispanics that are LGBTQ members. LGBT being lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. Uh, and bullying at what age level? I want to focus mostly on um, teenagers and probably older because that's when bullying really takes place in teenagers. And uh, among Latinos or any particular group? Maybe. Maybe. No. Um, yeah. I don't have a particular group in mind. Okay. So. Fair enough. Uh, I belong to a board of directors of the Latino Commission on AIDS, and they have a major programs relating to LGBT issues with, uh, around identity as well as health issues. And so they, they're a resource, and they're here, here in New York. Central, however, yeah, we have many books on LGBTQ issues, um, a few dissertations. We also have the Homo Visiones um, collection, which is a series of like like short films on, on LGBTQ issues. Um, we have a, a lot of dissertations. Lot of, yeah, dissertations for sure. Yeah. And there we have, uh, which hasn't been mentioned, but the Centro has a journal, a yeah. research uh, journal. Yeah. Want me to bring that book? Yeah, okay. there's a there's an actual. Uh, issue of the Central Journal that's all about LGBT issues. So it would be a wonderful resource where you'll see the issue both from a male, a female perspective. There may be uh, issues relating to race as, as well as, as ethnicity. Uh, and what year was that? 2007. Uh, it's a very big issue as you can see. And there's art, there's uh, photographs, there's bibliography, uh, and uh, it's very, very prized and well done. And people uh, in the universities here in New York, I have a, a college friend who went to Stanford with me and he teaches at Fordham University. And he has spent most of his life focusing on the issue of LGBT in his research. So the, there's a lot of material. How about um, yourself? Um, I'm doing how hip hop influences the Latin American society today. Latin American society today. We have uh, and this is on the on the you can see it on the website. Like Rivera yeah. donated papers, and she's a scholar that specialized on hip hop and reggaeton. Raquel uh, Rivera worked at Centro as a researcher yes. uh, and uh, she developed lots of resources. Uh, I'm, I, did I see something here about hip hop? Is this, this good art? Um, I could bring uh, the hip hop zone. We have many, many materials relating to the, uh, the New Eurekan. Mm -hmm. poetry movement as well as the hip-hop movement uh, and all of the influences whether it's in the Lower East Side or in the South Bronx lots of materials uh, here I don't have them out but we have eight posters that are about two feet by three feet five of which are a chronology from like 1200 going pre-Columbia all the way up until the 20th, uh, 2012, a history, a story with, uh, if you look at one of those in the middle, the yellow, the yellow poster, 
that's an example of the Puerto Rican cultural roots all the way up to 1898. And you see photos, uh, there's, a story, there's a timeline down the middle, and there are paragraphs that describe events and people in that storyline. It's a series of eight, five historical posters and three that are geographic posters. One that shows you the United States map and then where are Puerto Ricans in the United States, uh, in each of the states, and then uh, two that show the diaspora, the movement, the migration from uh, Africa to the Caribbean, from Europe to the Caribbean, uh, from Venezuela to Puerto Rico, from Puerto Rico to the Islas Vigenes, to Miami, to New York. And so you get a, a, a visual picture of how we have migrated and spread throughout. And uh, we have a, uh, what you're seeing is on our website, if we hit uh, Diasporas in History P1, we'll get a sense of a clip because we have this on our website, uh, this web page that goes with this, you can actually see, uh, you can click on the poster where we're giving these posters away to schools that are willing to write a letter to us on their letterhead and, and let us know how they'll use them. We are, we're planning to make them available uh, as a set. Uh, otherwise they would be sold as a set for a hundred dollars, but for free. Uh, and then this this is the map on the of Africa, Europe, Latin America, the United, the United States, and the Caribbean. And I just want to hit the, the, the video. Uh, this is Dr. Virginia Sanchez Coro, who's a historian at Brooklyn College. She's written many books, and she uh, participated in the preparation along with another Puerto Rican professor from SUNY Albany, Edna Acosta Belen, in the creation of this poster series. All of it with the help of many other historians. Central PR, centralpr.hunter.puny.edu. It's on all the materials yeah, that you've got, including if you would give me the bookmark so I can give them out. Uh, Uh, it has the website, but if you go there and and check out the the post the series, you'll get to a web page that we saw there that has the eight posters. And when you click on poster one, you'll be able to access and see the poster, and click on the video and watch a five to 10 minute segment about that poster with the people who uh, wrote the material, the historical material about Dr. Virginia Sanchez Coral and others talking about different uh, parts of the history of Puerto Ricans in education, in political participation, in community struggles in the 60s and 70s. Uh, you see pictures of the Puerto Rican Day Parade, old pictures of the original uh, founding of the Puerto Rican Day Parade and many of the other agencies. So that's, I think, it. And I hope it's been very useful to you. Uh, please uh, stay around for some snacks. Yeah, we have some refreshments. Some refreshments, and if you take a look around, you can see what you've been uh, seeing in the room, but maybe not up close mm -hmm. and personal. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you, and please tell your friends in the other schools that we're here, <laughs> so that those who couldn't make it today will make the trip on their own. And all you have to do is uh, look at the 
materials that have phone numbers and email addresses if you want to make an appointment to come visit, either individually or uh, two or three of you. Uh, unfortunately, not on Saturdays. <laughs> the budgets, yeah. you know, if you if you manage to pull some. Uh, money from the budget people, tell them to make sure to include the Mexican Studies Institute, Dominican Studies Institute, Center for Puerto Rican Studies, and even the Latino Studies uh, Department at Queens College who are going to be your hosts if you get to go to the May 2nd Symposium.